Welcome back to the Vicarage here at St Michael's St Albans as we continue to celebrate the glorious season of Easter. One of the challenges of traditional churches like mine is that everyone sits in serried rows and this makes it hard to use imagery for reflection by the whole congregation. So let's take advantage of the wonders of the internet and bring a few images of Easter direct to your screens as we consider what they might mean for the life of faith today. So less of me and more of the risen Jesus as we turn to consider our first image. Depicting the events of Easter has always been a challenge. Should the artist aim for realism or symbolism, an expression of what happened or an exploration of why it is important? Here is an early representation of the women talking to the angel on Easter Day from the 12th century St Albans Psalter. The picture is redolent of the beautiful colours of illuminated manuscripts, but struggles to escape the two-dimensionality of the page. Leap forward three centuries and the Italian Piero della Francesca helps us in this regard. Piero's famous resurrection applies the techniques of perspective to show Jesus stepping from the tomb. Jesus looks us straight in the face, drawing us into the scene and confronting us with the power of his return. Piero uses symbolism too. Contrast, if you will, the wintry trees behind Jesus' right shoulder and their springing back to life on the other side. The slumbering soldiers also serve as a warning that we must be attentive to where God is at work. It is worth noting that Piero painted this resurrection for a public hall in the appropriately named town of San Sulpicuro, Holy Sepulchre in Tuscany. The function of the painting was to encourage the magistrates and councillors in the godly conduct of their business in that place. Fifty years after Piero's resurrection, Titian captured a slightly later moment from Easter morning. Here is the encounter between Jesus and Mary Magdalene in the Easter garden. Mary longs to grab the risen Jesus, but Jesus instructs her, Nolle me tangere, do not hold on to me. In the context of Easter, Mary is being prepared for Jesus' ascent into heaven. In the context of coronavirus, may we find comfort in this image as we long for closer contact with family, friends and church community, but are currently prohibited. As the Dean of St Albans puts it, sometimes love has to learn how to be loved without touch and without physical reassurance. Christ is with us in spirit, as he was with Mary. Of course, the sheer otherness of the resurrection has led many to doubt. This next painting by John Granville Gregory is a reworking of the more famous Incredulity of St Thomas by Caravaggio. It's called Still Doubting and hangs in Bangor Cathedral in North Wales. The depiction of Jesus is as classical as in Caravaggio's original, but the disciples are transformed into contemporary figures like you and me. The eyes of Doubting Thomas are the centre of the scene, gawping at the seeming impossibility of his risen master. The intensity of his stare is exaggerated all the more by his glasses. I think that this painting shows how faith and doubt have a symbiotic vitality in every age. Another popular Easter topic is the supper which Jesus shared in the village of Emmaus. This image is a genuine Caravaggio. It shows two disciples who had fled Jerusalem on Easter Day, seated at a table with an unknown third figure who had joined them on the road. The fourth man standing in the background is perhaps an innkeeper. The stranger is caught in the act of blessing food and drink. It is a dramatic posture which opens the disciples' eyes to recognise his true identity. The disciple on the viewer's left grips the arms of his chair, caught in the moment of realisation. Opposite him, the other disciple throws wide his arms in amazement, reaching to take in that which is beyond his imagination. The supper at Emmaus is an intimate scene, relevant for these days in which we are meeting God in our households and around domestic tables. However, an international future awaits the men in Caravaggio's painting. Note the scallop shell on the cloak. It's a sign of Christian pilgrimage. Although the man may not yet know it, he has been marked out for a lifetime of discipleship, 
a path that will take him much further than the seven miles from Jerusalem to Emmaus. Much art of Easter goes beyond the gospel narrative of what happened and into deeper explanation of its significance. An early example is this Eastern Orthodox picture called Anastasis, the standing up, the resurrection. This picture does not capture events in Jerusalem in 33 AD, but rather blows up the meaning of Easter onto a cosmic canvas. Here we see Jesus in the centre, radiant in triumph. In his left hand, he drags Adam from the tomb. Adam is representative of each of us, unworthy through our fallen state to access heaven. Jesus is trampling down the gates of hell, below which are shackles of mortality and death. Jesus bridges an impossible gulf, guiding Adam into heaven, where Peter and other saints stand ready to greet them. Jesus remains that bridge for believers, drawing our fallen state into eternity. Thus we see ordinary everyday believers within the communion of saints. The 20th century artist Stanley Spencer had a go at expressing this in his resurrection at Cookham. The scene is the Berkshire village in which Spencer spent most of his life. The painting shows not Jesus' return from the dead, but the rising of all Christians on the last day. Here they are, the rude forefathers of the hamlet, confused and stiff, stretching into the light, reinvigorated through God's almighty power. They are a snapshot of the Christian hope for all believers. And so to our final and most recent image, Roger Wagner's flowering tree, a stained glass window above the font in St Mary's Church, Ifley, near Oxford. This beautiful picture shows the promise of the Tree of Life in the mythical Garden of Eden at the beginning of the Bible, and the repositioning of that tree in the Eternal City in Revelation 22, the very last chapter of the Bible. The tree is also the cross, but the cross is no longer an instrument of torture, but a promise of blessing, blossoming like fruit trees at Easter time. In Roger Wagner's own words, a tree, a river and a man who hangs from branches thick with flowers, a love which flowed since time began, is measured here in three long hours. Wagner's flowering tree reminds us that even before the ink was dry on the New Testament, Christians were straining to express the enormity of Easter, not in paint on canvas, but words on parchment. Just like the pictures we've been viewing, these writings used earthly letters and words to explore the resurrection. One of these was worded into a blessing at the end of the letter to the Hebrews. Hebrews was written to an audience of Christians who'd grown up in Judaism and seeks to show how the stories of the Old Testament find their fulfilment in Jesus. Thus the author of Hebrews discovers a type for the resurrection in the Jewish exodus from slavery in Egypt into freedom in the promised land, that time when God formed an agreement, a covenant to be with his people through thick and thin. So in those words from Hebrews, may the God of peace who brought up again from the dead, like in the exodus, our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the eternal covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be upon us and remain with us today and always. Amen.